Good morning. So my name is Murray. Glad to be here on this crisp Sunday morning. It's Saskatoon. I don't know about you, but a lot of times my heart really gets severely out of alignment. And so it always seems to be pulling kind of to one side or the other, and I've got this one ditch of just self-sufficiency, and I've got this other ditch of, of uh, just self-centeredness. And so from time to time, we need to really stop and just let the Holy Spirit uh, really challenge us to recenter ourselves once again on who we are in Jesus and the mission and calling that he's, he's laid on our lives that he has bought with his own blood. So I'm going to ask all of you who are a part of Grace Fellowship, who call this home, and maybe some of you who, who are uh, just getting to know us and, and uh, just want to know more about, about Grace Fellowship and really who we are, to uh, encourage you, please be here on January the 8th. So that's Sunday, January the 8th. And that's where we're going to really recenter ourselves as Jesus' body. We're going to align ourselves together with the head of the church, who is Jesus, and uh, with his priorities. And we want to covenant together as a church to really uh, walk this walk together. Because January 8th, it's our partnership Sunday. And this is where we, we realign ourselves once again together as a covenant people who are owned and operated by Jesus. And so it's also uh, January 9th, actually, so this is just one day off, our sixth anniversary as a church, and uh, that's where 13 brave, or maybe we could call them crazy individuals, believed God could do something here in our city. And so uh, what we do is we, we come together, we covenant together for, for a year feeling God is calling us together to continue this mission, and really at the end of each year, we just... We dissolve all of those, and we just ask for that time of, do you still believe God is calling you to be a part of what's happening here? And so you don't have this, this endless uh, Hotel California kind of membership where you, know, you can never leave, that uh, we want people who are called by, by the Spirit of God, called by Jesus, to be on this mission together. And January 8th is kind of that day where we kind of just refocus and, and uh, come together really for that. And so we are going to talk about covenant because I think we don't understand typically what exactly that means. And so uh, to that end, we've got a scripture that we're going to take you to in Genesis chapter 15. Kind of a strange passage, but hopefully um, it'll be not only maybe understood a little better, hopefully after today, but actually valued and loved as a tremendous chapter in the, in the scripture. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. So if you want to turn there in your Bible or your app, if you don't own a Bible, I think there's still a couple Bibles left here on the table. We'd love for you, you can just come down, borrow one of those Bibles and just use that to be able to follow along to see what it actually does say for yourself. And if you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you just to be able to take one of those Bibles, take it home with you. It's our gift to you. And uh, for kids, if you want to follow along as well and... and uh, uh, there's uh, papers on there for you to, if you want to jot down any notes about the message, draw a picture about the message, something that's in this message, and if you hand that in to me, once you've got, once I have five from you, we've got a prize bag that you can select a prize for you, and I had somebody do that this morning. Dominic got the prize that he wanted, so, so that's good. So, and it's a blessing for me to, to read the notes and actually hear what you are getting and hearing from God through the message. So that's a huge encouragement to me. So here's our, our scripture then, Genesis chapter 15. A reading from Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. 
And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all of these, cut them in half, and laid each over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenzedites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. Good job, Larry, and all those ites, and the Mennonites, and the Mosquito Bites, and all the other ites that, that were there. Good job. And I also need to apologize to Lana. She's going to be uh, doing the ASL interpretation. And of course, this is uh, something on covenant. And covenant is such a unique thing in our experience because there is no other words. In fact, if you take a Bible dictionary and you're looking up for synonyms of covenant, it's blank. There's no synonyms. There's not other words you can use that talk about what covenant actually means. So, so what a challenge for her, right, to try to interpret this. So I hope you will forgive me after this, on this, this topic, so we'll go through. You will also find there's an outline of the passage on your take-home sheet, and for some of you, maybe with this passage in particular, you might actually find that very helpful, and if you are a note-taker, then you do have some paper on there as well, but you might just even to be able to keep track of kind of where we are. But, but truly, one of the very key themes of the Bible is covenant, and so it's it's crucial to have a covenant relationship with God. And so um, if we're going to rebuild our lives really as a, um, and live in covenant relationship with God, I really think we should know what it is. And so what is a covenant relationship with God? And why don't we just come up with a less archaic word than covenant? You know, find something more modern, maybe we can put in that. And that's because, because it's a unique concept. There just is no other word that can just replace it. So in Deuteronomy, which is where um, Moses, uh, who doesn't get to actually enter the promised land after uh, God had delivered his people out of Egypt from slavery, uh, taking him to this promised land, and, and Moses doesn't get to actually enter into that just through his own disobedience and in the purposes of God. And so he gives the, the, the nation of Israel these final words. And anytime you're giving final words, they're usually some of the most important things that you want to say because you realize, this is the last time I'm going to get to talk to you. So what you say becomes very important. And so in Deuteronomy 29, we've got Moses giving these last words. And it's interesting. The most important thing he thinks they need to hear, the, the last thing he needs to say to them, and it's all about covenant. Covenant. And he says this in Deuteronomy 29, he says, Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. You're standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who's in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God 
which the Lord your God is making with you today, that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So, so this covenant with God then is done as a part of his people, with a part really of his community. He continues, verse 14, it is not with you alone that I'm making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God and with whoever is not here with us today. You know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. Remember, this is Moses giving his last, last words then to the people. And you have seen their detestable things, their idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, which was among them. Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root um, bearing poisonous and bitter fruit, right? The root of that just starting to grow. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be safe though I walk on in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man, and the curses written in this book will settle upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Now, there's a couple things I do want to notice what Moses does uh, say about covenant. First, you'll notice the language of love and intimacy that's connected to covenant. For example, if you look in verse 13, right, you'll see there these personal possessive pronouns. It says covenant people are his people, right, not just a people. And, and notice he will be your God, not just God. And so whenever you hear these personal possessive pronouns, you know that that someone's talking about an intimate relationship. Because if you overhear somebody, even if you don't even know who they are, and you hear them talk and they say, There's, oh, my Johnny or my Susie, right? You would assume, who's that person talking about? Well, one of their, maybe, maybe their child, maybe it's their spouse, uh, but at least it's someone very close, right? Someone very intimate, as soon as you use that, those pronouns. And secondly, we also see that with covenant, it, it uses legal language. And so it's a sworn covenant, he says in verses 12. You'll see it again in verse 14 in that passage. So, so what is a covenant? So a covenant is a relationship, but it's a relationship that's more loving and more intimate than merely a legal relationship. And it's yet it's more binding and more enduring and accountable than merely just a personal relationship. So the, the covenant is a personal relationship, but it's made more loving and intimate because it's legal. Through voluntary and mutual binding promises, vows to be loving, to be faithful, no matter what the circumstances, that's a covenant. So it has both this relationship and legal aspect to it. Now, our culture, for the most part, does not really grasp covenant. And that's because, for the most part, just about everything revolves around individual happiness and fulfillment, where the individual happiness and fulfillment and rights are the absolute, and everything else is just a means to that end. So in many relationships, you've got two people, they look at each other and they say, I will be what I should be as long as and to the degree that you are what you should be. And if you're not, I'm out of here. But in a covenant, the people actually look at each other and say, I will be what I should be, whether you are being what you should be or not. And so it's scary to get into a covenant because it only works really if both parties are committed to that. In a covenant relationship, both have to say, I'll be what I should be even if you are not what you should be. Now, if only one 
says that and the other does not, that doesn't work so well, right? Then what you have is exploitation. That's when you get abuse, right? If you get into a covenant relationship, though, where both parties are committed to the promise, right? Where you are more important than me. The relationship, this is more important than my needs. I'll be committed to your needs before my needs. I'll be committed to the relationship even if it's not meeting my needs at the moment. That means I give you my independence as a gift of love. If that is the heart commitment of both, then it's a deep and fulfilling and joyful relationship. It's far beyond a consumer relationship in which each side says, well, I'm going to be in this as long as I'm getting my needs met. As long as you're meeting my needs, I'm still in. Now, not every relationship needs to be, nor should it be, a covenant relationship. Many of our relationships actually should be consumer relationships. For example, I used to get my oil changed at a particular place, and I tried to get to know the owner, tried to get to know some of the people that worked there kind of on a regular basis. And then I found a place much closer to where I live that had a much lower price, and they even washed my car. I was out of there. I was out of there. And I have a new place now where I get my oil changes. Because it's a consumer relationship, right? It's not a covenant relationship. So I didn't even feel guilty. And plenty of our relationships should be like that. But the deepest, the most glorious relationships are covenantal relationships. And so God always has declared, if you want a relationship with him, it has to be covenantal. It has to be. Now, a lot of people consider themselves spiritual, meaning they believe in God. They even want a relationship with God. But they don't want to be part of an institution They don't want to be part of a local church. They don't want to give up any freedom. They don't want to yield up any of their preferences. But that's what I would call smorgasbord Christianity. Right? I'll take a little of that. Ooh, that looks good. I'll try some of that. Ooh, don't put that on my plate. I'm not having any of that. Right? But what they're saying is, they're saying this, I want a personal relationship with God but not a covenantal relationship. But the Bible says that's impossible because God only relates in terms of covenant. Every time he relates to somebody, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Peter, Paul, it's always covenantal. It's the only way you can relate to God. He won't have it any other way. In fact, even if you are Jesus' birth mother, a personal relationship, even one as close as that as being your physical mother, is not enough. We learned that in John chapter 2, right? At the wedding. And so we saw it must be covenantal. It must be covenantal. So, the terms of the covenant. If you're following your outline, we're on number two. Because all covenants have terms, or there's conditions, right? Because all contracts have terms and conditions. Now, a covenant is more than a contract, but it is not less than a contract. And all contracts have terms or conditions. So if you you meet the terms or the conditions of the contract, then there's rewards or blessings. If you fail to meet them, if you violate the terms or the conditions, then there are penalties, or in the language of the Bible, curses. Look at uh, verse 9, then, of Deuteronomy 29, where we read. He says, Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. So the call there in that covenant relationship was to follow the terms, follow the conditions, follow the words of this covenant to do them. And so it's not just agree with them. They had to do them. And if you violate the covenant, right, there's penalties. That's what makes a a contract really a big deal, right? So that's why I look at the language in verse 18, right? So beware, he says. 
You know, watch that heart if it starts to, that little root of, you know, starts to, to grow in there. In verse 20, where he closed out with, the Lord will not be willing to forgive him. But rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. The curses written in this book will settle upon him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Whoa. I mean, I thought God was a forgiving God. Yes. But first and foremost, he is a covenant God. And what good is a covenant if you can basically just ignore the terms and say, well, who cares? I'll just forgive you. Throughout the Bible, in every book, in fact, I think you'll find statements where God says, I cannot bless a disobedient people. I cannot. You must obey. I am a just judge. And I'll by no means clear the guilty, he says. Right? I can't simply just wink at sin. Right? can't just simply sweep it all under the carpet. Pretend it wasn't there. Right? In fact, if you had an earthly judge who just winked at sin, the guilty, and just swept it under the carpet, he'd be run out of town. How much less than the holy, righteous God of heaven and earth? So you must completely fulfill all the terms of the covenant. The covenant is that serious. And God says, I just can't turn a blind eye to it. Right? I can't turn a blind eye and bless a disobedient people. And there's hundreds of statements like that. But what about those other statements that say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Right? I'll never give up on you. you know, I'll always accept you. In fact, if you read through the Psalms, you've got God saying, I can only bless you if you do this. And at other times, you've got God saying, I'm going to bless you no matter what. I mean, you seem to have this unresolvable tension. And it's this tension, in fact, that actually drives the story of the Bible forward. Because you see God's people, and they're failing, and they're falling, and they're <laughs> failing again. And the question comes up, well, will God give in to his people and just accept them no matter what they do? Well, then what about his justice? What about his holiness? What about his covenant relationship, right? Is God just going to maybe just then give up on his people, right? Then what about his faithfulness? What about his promises? You know, so are the blessings of God, are they, are they conditional or are they unconditional? I mean, do you have to perfectly obey all the terms of the covenant? Or does it not matter what you do because you're going to receive the blessing of God anyway. And, and people tend to come down on one side or the other. Uh, some say, well, yes, you should obey, but I mean, in the end, God loves you. He'll accept you. And then you got the other end of the spectrum and saying, well, yes, God is very loving and, and everything like that, but in the end, you've got to be good and obedient or he's not going to love and accept you. So are the Promises and blessings of God, are they conditional? Or are the blessings of God unconditional? So depending how you answer that, right, the, you're going to end up sliding, as we said. Basically, you're going to be feeling like, well, I can pretty much live the way I want to, ultimately, because God is going to love me anyway. So then sin is not seen as that big a deal. Or else you slide towards that conditional fully end of things, and you end up feeling guilt-ridden and condemned and shame because you're never living up. And so it will impact greatly your relationship with God, how you think about Him, how you view yourself. So we have God saying to His people, I've sworn to bless you. And we also have God saying, I've sworn to not bless a disobedient people. So how do you resolve this? Well, we need to go back to where God swore his covenant oath, and it's in Genesis 15, where we, we had that passage right up on the screen when we opened up here. And if you understand what actually happened in Genesis 15, then I think you're actually getting to the very heart of what the Bible's all about. In Genesis 15, 
We won't reread it again, but hopefully you can remember that. Maybe you were confused, maybe not as we went through it. But, but you've got God saying to Abraham, and then in the passage he was still called Abram, but later God does call him Abraham, so I'll tend to refer to him as Abraham. And he says, I will bless you, and your reward is going to be very great. And then Abraham, you can just see him, right? And he's starting to, he's got some doubts. And he's going, well, how do I know? And how, I mean, how can I be sure? Because it's, you know? And I love God's response to his doubts, right? He doesn't say, how dare you question me, you little worm. He, he just it patiently and gently deals with Abraham in his doubts because he wants Abraham's Faith to actually grow strong, just as he does yours and mine, that we would truly trust him. And so Abraham's doubts, we see, are kind of placed in two places. First in God, because it's been decades since God had made that promise, that he would have an offspring through whom then would have this multitude, right? And, and this offspring was going to happen. But yet, it's been decades, and there's nothing. And he's aging. And, and his wife's already in past childbearing years. And so it's not looking good. As he looks at his circumstances, he starts to doubt God. And then secondly, he has this doubt in himself. I mean, he's just pimped out his wife twice at the first sign of trouble, right, to, to protect himself, to save his own neck. And I don't think he can feel very confident if at the verse, first sign of trouble you throw your wife under the bus. So Abraham knows that he has proven to be very unreliable, right? So he's thinking, ah, what if I screw up again, right? I'm bound to is what he's thinking. So he's got doubts in God. He's got doubts in himself. And so God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to kill some animals, and then I want you to cut them into pieces, and you're going to arrange the pieces in two rows with an aisle down the middle so that you can walk through them. Now, the birds, he doesn't, he, they're, they're killed and slaughtered, but they're just set on each side as well. But the other animals, he cuts them in pieces on each side. Now, this to us can seem totally confusing, because we're going, what is this? But not to Abraham. When God mentioned it, in fact, Abraham knew exactly what he was talking about. And so in those days, when a great Lord wanted to make a covenant with a peon, with a peasant, with, with someone, then this is how it was done. And so animals were slain, the pieces arranged, and then the servant would take this oath of loyalty to the Lord and, and the servant did that oath of loyalty as he was walking through the pieces down this, this aisle. Why? Because he was acting out the curse of the covenant. He was saying, I swear loyalty to you, O Lord, and if I do not keep my promises to do the terms of the covenant, may I be cut in pieces like this. May it be done to me as it was done to these animals. So covenant was a pretty serious, big deal, right? And in fact, the, the Hebrew word for covenant literally means to cut. To cut. So they would rephrase the verse, to cut a covenant. And so Abraham figured he's then arranging for a situation for a covenant ceremony. So he cuts the pieces up, and he expected, as he's laid them out on the sides, creating this aisle way to walk through, he's expecting then that he's going to be called to walk through, because kings and lords never actually walked through the pieces, because they're the givers in this arrangement, they're the givers in the agreement. So he does this, he sets it all up, and then he, he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and then all of a sudden, Genesis 15 tells us that there's a, this incredible darkness came down. It was this darkness of judgment, and in the midst of the darkness was God. And so God appeared, and he manifested his presence visibly as this smoking fire pot and this fiery torch or fiery pillar, just like he would appear later on Mount Sinai. 
And as such, then God actually passed through the pieces as he promised to bless Abraham. All the while, Abraham had been given a divine anesthetic and was sleep off to the side. So this is kind of startling. Because that means that God is, is not just saying, I will bless you. But he's promising to die if he doesn't bless him. He's promising to be torn to pieces if he doesn't bless Abraham. And Abraham was never called to go through the pieces himself. And that's unheard of. And in fact, the whole covenant ceremony, it ended, and we're told in Genesis 15, 18, that the Lord made a covenant with Abraham that day. Now, it was shocking, first of all, for the Lord to walk through the pieces, but for the servant then to not even make an oath. So do you know what that meant? It meant that God was making the promise for both of them. And he was taking the curse of the covenant for both of them. So in so doing, he was saying this. He says, not only will I be torn to pieces if I don't keep my promise, but I'll be torn to pieces if you don't. So the meaning is clear. God makes himself responsible for both sides of the covenant. If God fails to keep up his side of the bargain, he will pay with his own blood. But if Abraham fails to keep up his side of the bargain, God will also pay with his own blood. So Abraham, God is saying, I will bless you even if it means my immortality must become mortal. Ah, the Christmas story. Even if my glory must be drowned in darkness, even if I have to literally be torn in pieces, and he was, because centuries later, darkness came down on a mountain ridge through which the city of Jerusalem was built, Mount Calvary, Golgotha, on a cross in thick darkness, where Mark 15, 30 says, says at the sixth hour, that's at 12 noon, darkness came over the whole land. When Jesus went to the cross, darkness came down again. There was this thick darkness of terror and dread. Isaiah 53, 6 says this about the suffering servant as he does a work of substitution. It says he was cut off from the land of the living. That's covenant language. That's covenant language. In the midst of the darkness, there was God in the person of Jesus, and he was literally torn to pieces. You've got the nails, and you've got the spears, and you've got the thorns, and you've got the scourging. Why? He was taking the covenant curse. In the book of Galatians, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to us through faith in Jesus. Was God's son dying because he hadn't kept up his end of the bargain? Absolutely not. He was dying because we hadn't kept up ours. He's the hero of this covenant. Third point, if you're trying to follow the outline. I think I'm already well into the third. But here's where the tension's resolved, right? That's where, where Paul writes in Romans chapter 4 how God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That the blessings of God, well, are they conditional or unconditional? It's yes. Yes, right? And on the cross, Jesus absolutely fulfilled the conditions of the covenant so that God could love you absolutely unconditionally. Yeah. With 
his perfect life, Jesus completely fulfilled the terms of the covenant and earned the blessing. But with his sacrificial death, he completely fulfilled the curse of the covenant, and that leaves the blessing for you and for me and anyone who just lives up empty hands of faith to this Lord. So if you're looking at the blessings of God as only conditional, you'll always be feeling like, I'm not living up, right? You always feel this sense of shame and condemnation. On the other hand, if you basically believe that, well, God just lives every, every, loves everybody unconditionally, then you'll feel like, well, obedience is a good thing, but you don't take it that seriously. But when you understand that Jesus himself fulfilled the conditions, that radical sacrifice cost to himself so that we could be loved unconditionally, that changes everything. Because therefore, if you understand the gospel there's this fascinating double power it gives. Because you'll resist and hate sin like crazy. Because you see it against the one who has loved you like this. And because he has loved you like this, you'll never have that sense of condemnation and despair when you do fall into it, and you will. To me, that's amazing. Secondly, this covenant relationship just leads to absolute trust. You know, it's scary to get married. And do you know why? Because you have two people who say, I'm going to sacrifice and give everything for you. But you look across there and you go, how do you know about them? How do they know about you? And then how do you know about you? So when two people come together, right, they say, I'm going to give my life for you. I'm, I'm going to do everything for you. Because you're not really sure if that other person's going to really do it. And you're not even sure if you will. So it's kind of scary to get married. But that's another sermon. <laughs> but when Jesus calls you into covenant relationship... So he is saying, in a sense, he is saying, I want to marry you. I want you to come into a legally binding, intimate love relationship with me, but this one you don't have to be uncertain of. Because I've already, at the front end, taken the plunge of love. I've already died for you. So trust him. I mean, what more could he do than that? And third, in this covenant... It, it leads, that leads to church membership. Because once you understand the gospel, accountability isn't this horrible thing. Right? You understand accountability is good for you, and therefore, throughout the Bible, you'll see that the people who are brought into this covenant relationship with God are also brought into a covenant relationship with others who've experienced the same grace. And they're accountable to other believers. And we know they're broken. You know I'm broken. So, and they don't come to, to church as some consumer. But they covenant. And they say, I'm a partner in this common venture. And so I support. And, and I'm responsible for bringing the blessing of the blood-bought presence of the Spirit that's in me to you. So in other words, they join the church. They don't just come. That's one of the implications of the new covenant. And so the covenant Lord, who's the husband over us, it's not just a relationship to be dabbled in. It's a serious relationship with a covenant God. And it is wonderful. It's wonderful. Do we have any questions? One question so far. As a human with flesh that is sinful, how is it possible to have a covenant relationship? Any covenant relationship that's going to work at all starts with a covenant relationship with God. So if, if we're talking a marriage covenant there, which I'm not, I'm not totally sure if you are, but, but there's really two places where we manifest covenant in, a, in our culture. I'll tell you, one is marriage, 
which is a covenant relationship. So it is a contract. It's got legal. It's a serious vow. But it's also an intimate love relationship. And these two things then are combined. People want it today. They want to have a relationship, but they just want to have a personal relationship, live together with a personal relationship without covenant. And to, for others, it's just this legal arrangement that's done without the love intimacy. But covenant is both. But it's always centered on God. And there'll be no marriage covenant that's going to flourish and soar the way it was designed to without Jesus being that center. And that's the covenant relationship. And I know for myself, until really Jesus opened my eyes to the reality of who he was and the gospel, I never loved my wife, though I was in a covenant relationship with her. I didn't know Jesus. And so I loved myself. And I loved what she could do for me. I loved the way she looked. I loved that. I loved everything about that. But that was a, that's not a covenant relationship, and that's not love. And really until experiencing, not just hearing about, but experiencing the love of Jesus for me, where this God who I didn't care anything about, this God who I had offended so strongly, whose covenant I'd broken, and he laid down his life for me, suddenly I began to see what love was, and I realized I didn't love her at all. All my life I had just loved me. And that was the beginning when Jesus and the gospel, and you begin to find your identity in the gospel, that's the beginning where you can begin to actually love like a covenant was designed. And that love should be shown in marriages, and it should be shown in the church. We don't always see it in marriages, not even in Christian marriages. We don't always see it in the church, not even in the Christian church. But that's what we want to be. Right? That's why I appreciated Kurt and Kendall and, and uh, Chris and Natalie coming up here and sharing that, right? Because we don't see that. But if we can get glimpses of it, and we are going to fail, but that's why we have the kind of covenant king we have. He takes the curse. He's bore that for us. Which is what then, when we get that pushed back into our hearts more and more, it's, we start to be enabled by the spirit of love to begin to love. And so we're going to fail you as a church, just like your spouse is going to fail you in the marriage. But because of King Jesus, there's place for ongoing repentance, ongoing work of the Spirit, ongoing renewal, and that's what we try to share together in the, in the community. I'll, I'll say this. Um, put up this verse on the screen up there from Proverbs. Proverbs 24, 16. Great little verse for us, I think, that will, I think, connect, hopefully, with this question. <clears throat> I had the verse already prepared, even though I didn't know the question. But it fits. It says in Proverbs, it says, For the righteous falls seven times and rises again. I want you to notice some things about this passage. I mean, think about this. What is a given here about the righteous? Yeah, you, you don't see any word if there, do you? Right? Now imagine a guy, he falls seven times, and what God says, a righteous man gets back up every time. See, your righteousness is not shown by never falling. But righteousness, in a righteous person, your declaration is that where you falter, our covenant God is still faithful. Abraham fell several times in really big ways. But each time, God says, Abraham, get up. I still have a plan. Now, I know some of you have messed up badly. Get up. That's what our covenant king is saying. And getting up is a declaration of faith that God has not given up on you. And he's proved that in Jesus. It's your faith. In fact, it's your getting up. That's your faith declaration. He still has a plan to bless and multiply your life and somehow use it for good. Like he did with all those other messed up people in the Bible. So, did you mess up bad? Get up. He walked through Calvary alone. And he'll never give up on you. You didn't have to walk through the pieces. 
You didn't have to take the oath. God took it all on himself. That's the grace of the gospel. Every religion says, do this and God will bless you. Only, only the gospel says God came and did this so he could bless you unconditionally. So let's get up and walk as his covenant people. In our marriages, in our church family, really into... So that the world around us can see the reality of what covenant is. Because it's a word not understood. It's an it's a idea that's not understood but is central to the gospel and who God is and our relationship with him. Really, any relationship that's centered on Jesus. And so to, to help you, to help you this coming year, really to, to keep getting up when you fall and to keep you being centered on Jesus, we've got a couple resources. One, you'll read it on the, if you go to the gracesass.com website on the blog there, um, there's a Bible reading app put together by Francis Chan, Crazy Love, the church they have, and the Bible Project guys. And it uh, includes in the scriptures from the Bible projects. It includes reading then the scripture to help you, guide you to read through the, through the Bible. And then there's a psalm that they give you to pray through. Hakaf, you remember that message in Psalm 1, that we respond and interact with God, and so we pray through that psalm. So you're not just get caught up just reading. And so the details of that are on the websites, on the blog, reading through the scripture this coming year. It's uh, called the Read Scripture app. And the second thing we want to do, we've got a discipleship resource. Hopefully we'll have that ready in place for the beginning of the new year. There's 52 weeks that, that you can just kind of walk through. You can do it on your own. It doesn't take you that long. So each do a small bit each week, once, one time a week. And it's just really helping you to Center your identity on the gospel of Jesus. And then we hope then that if others are going through it too, that you can kind of group together and kind of connect and in community, challenge each other with what God is teaching you. And then all the assignments is helping you live out your identity as a Jesus follower. So we're hopeful that these two resources will help you keep getting up, keep getting re-centered, keep having the gospel pushed down to your heart this coming year so it would be a year of great growth in your walk with Jesus this year. So now to talk about the new covenant, I'm going to call it Brett as we remember this covenant that was cut for us by Jesus himself.